goes that way. Alors, grâce à votre retour, il y aura bientôt plus de personnes dans la salle que sur le podium. Ce qui est quand même très généreux euh, de euh, votre part. Euh, ça, ça me rappelle un peu un, un collège d'Oxford. Euh, il n'y avait plus d'étudiants. Et euh, il y avait une discussion. Faut-il inviter des étudiants euh, un vieux dean a dit « students, what for ?» Là, maintenant, c'est « public, what for ?» Mais donc, je vous remercie euh, de, de revenir. Alors, le, le, le dernier débat, il y a en réalité trois règles qui s'imposent. La première, c'est de terminer à l'heure. Car nous n'avons pas le, le choix euh, d'être en retard parce que certains d'entre vous ont des avions à prendre. La deuxième règle, c'est d'essayer, dans la mesure du possible, de traiter des thèmes qui n'ont pas été ou pas, assez ou pas été assez abordés lors de l'ensemble de la conférence. Et la troisième règle, qui est presque accessoire, c'est d'essayer de laisser les orateurs dire ce qu'ils ont envie de dire, quitte euh, pour le responsable, l'animateur, le modérateur de la séance, d'essayer de retrouver des liens entre ce qui a été dit. Donc il y a plusieurs sujets qui ont été à peine abordés. Et le premier, c'est euh, la réflexion de Karl Bildt, le mot manquant dans l'exposé brillantissime de Laurent Fabius, l'Ukraine. Donc on va parler d'Ukraine. On va parler aussi de zones géographiques européennes ou aux portes frontières de l'Europe euh, à partir d'abord de la présentation du ministre des Affaires étrangères de Roumanie, à partir aussi euh, du point de vue euh, d'un membre du Parlement turc. On parlera d'un sujet fondamental qui n'a pas été abordé et qui est l'autre lien avec cette exigence de justice qui a été mentionnée lors d'un dernier panel, qui est la question de la corruption. On parlera d'un continent largement négligé euh, pendant cette sixième World Policy Conference, qui est l'Amérique latine, et on terminera par une impression plus... Euh, je dirais personnel, d'un correspondant du New York Times qui a quitté Paris pour Londres et qui va nous donner sa vision des choses. Et on aura eu, entre-temps, un point de vue américain sur euh, la question de l'Ukraine et au-delà et un point de vue transatlantique pour ne pas oublier l'ouverture euh, à l'Ouest. Alors, je répète la règle du jeu, elle s'applique à tous dans un sentiment de justice et d'égalité. Vous avez entre 5 et 6 minutes pour vous exprimer. Je reviendrai vers vous, je vous traiterai avec euh, fairness. Monsieur le ministre Titus euh, Corlatan, euh, je vous passe la parole pour les 6 minutes que je vous ai donné. Merci. Euh, bonsoir. Je viens d'un pays francophone. Par conséquent, je vais commencer en français et continuer après ça en, en anglais. Mais bien sûr, j'aimerais remercier Thierry de Montréal et l'IFRI pour euh, l'invitation. Le sujet, euh, hier soir, euh, Laurent Fabius effectivement, a fait référence, euh, entre autres, euh, au voisinage de l'Union européenne, notamment à la politique de voisinage au sud et à l'est. C'est le sujet, je vais insister notamment sur le voisinage à l'est et sur les Balkans. Pourquoi Parce qu'il y a là-bas des forts intérêts politiques, géostratégiques, militaires, économiques, sécurité énergétique, conflits gelés. Et par conséquent, 
il y a des choses à dire euh, sur ce sujet. Mais je vais le faire euh, par le biais d'un filtre roman, par l'intermédiaire des sensibilités que nous avons dans mon pays, vu aussi l'histoire et notre expérience euh, régionale. Mais je vais commencer en faisant référence euh, à ce qu'un grand homme d'État français euh, disait il y a un siècle, Raymond Poincaré, qui disait effectivement « La Roumanie euh, se trouve aux portes de l'Orient » où tout est, tra est traité à la légère. Peut-être que c'est correct, au, au moins partiellement, mais quand je pense à l'histoire de mon pays, qui se trouvait à l'époque euh, au carrefour de trois empires, euh, autrichien, ottoman, russe, en tirant les, con les conséquences, bien sûr, euh, des guerres euh, balkaniques, de, de guerres euh, mondiales, une partition euh, euh, du pays dans des circonstances historiques euh, très compliquées, une période de régime communiste, un régime autoritaire, je crois que toutes ces choses n'ont pas été traitées à la légère, bien au contraire. Et c'est pour ça que tout ce qui, ce qui se passe dans notre région, vu aussi, c'est un petit détail, aujourd'hui c'est le 15 décembre, demain on va euh, anniverser, commémorer 24 ans après la révolution sanglante de décembre 89 en Roumanie. Euh, les hommes et les femmes qui sont sortis dans la rue pour les libertés, pour le droit, pour, pour la démocratie. C'est pour ça que nous sommes intéressés dans notre région, dans un espace élargi qui euh, dit euh, pour l'essentiel plus de stabilité, démocratie, droit et liberté. C'est l'essentiel de l'intérêt de mon euh, pays. Euh, Aujourd'hui, euh, euh, traite, en traitant à la légère ce sujet, quand même, la Roumanie se trouve à la frontière orientale de l'OTAN et de l'Union européenne. Je vais suivre en anglais, en disant que je suis un lawyer. J'ai gradué de la faculté de faculty in Bucharest. Je ne suis pas un ingénieur. Mais, en tout cas, je sais, depuis les années où j'ai suivi la école high school, et quite being a lover of physics, que c'est extrêmement important de reach un système stable. Aujourd'hui, le système international n'est pas plus stable. stable. And uh, thinking uh, to uh, what also Laurent Fabius uh, said uh, uh, last night about the bipolar, uh, unipolar, and the multipolar uh, world, uh, I'm saying that uh, today the international system is redefining itself for obvious reasons that we know. Economic crisis, political, ideological, uh, different other challenges uh, and uh, risks. It's the same keeping the proportion in our region. And I will uh, make uh, some brief comments on the Balkans and the Eastern uh, side. Nevertheless, concerning the Balkans, if we're looking behind us only 20, 25 years ago, today the Balkan region is almost predictable, which is a fundamental qualitative step forward because all in all we know that tomorrow, the day after tomorrow, all the Balkan region will be part of the European family, despite some nuances concerning some individual cases. But more or less, it's a predictable uh, situation compared to what was the situation 20, 25 years ago. It's not the case with the Eastern side. It's, a, of course, a much more fluid situation. We saw what is happening uh, today But from this perspective, I will uh, say also uh, through a European voice that there are some important mechanisms that we try to use, very briefly because time is short. The Eastern Partnership of the European Union with positive and less posi positive things, including happening uh, in the, the last uh, the Vilnius uh, summit in, uh, uh, organized by the European Union. Uh, very good news for the Republic of Moldova and uh, Georgia. Not so good news from our European perspective with uh, Ukraine, despite the fact, very interesting qualitative uh, transformation that today 60% of the Ukrainian population is in favor of uh, the rapprochement of the European uh, Union. Uh, the Black Sea Synergy, an initiative of Romania in 2007 with the support of the European Union and the German EU presidency, and uh, also the Danube strategy of the European Union, which puts in the connection 14 states, uh, EU and non-EU member states with projects financed by the European Union, navigability, infrastructure, 
bridges, uh, trade, uh, human exchanges, tourism. All three, very briefly, the significance of, of those three uh, tools and mechanisms is integration. More integration, cooperation, a better spirit. And this is once again, uh, the, let's say, the direction and the sensitivity that we have a more integrated uh, uh, region. Uh, making also the reference of a new Silk Road, why not? Making the connection between Central Asia through uh, the Caspian Black Sea region to the heart of uh, Europe. And I will uh, be close to, the <laughs> to my final uh, remarks saying that we are seeing this uh, as also a modality of having a, a stronger and much more influential uh, Europe. We will need, after the next uh, European elections for the new cycle of power within Europe, of a stronger and more efficient European political leadership which, with a stronger political vision that uh, will uh, uh, be much more efficient than maybe it was the case uh, before. In 30 seconds, uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, I would like to propose you uh, a small game, half uh, serious, half joking, um, which is nevertheless very relevant. Uh, day by day, the Europeans are using a very small item, but very important uh, 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 European institution, that means the currency, the euro. I don't know if you had the time to look carefully on, uh, on this uh, small item, but very important uh, item of uh, 50 euros, uh, not so small, but nevertheless. Uh, it's very interesting. If you are looking on, there's a picture right here the picture of Europe. The design of this picture, if I'm not wrong, it was made in 95, 96. Mm -hmm. uh, I suppose that when speaking about uh, such an important institution of European Union, this design maybe was not accidental, maybe it was a political planning or a visionary uh, spirit, I don't know. But it's very interesting, nevertheless, to see that on this map, European with the currency, uh, in 95, uh, we saw Central Eastern Europe, including my own country, Romania, already at that time, all the Balkan region, the Republic of Moldova, I'm very comfortable and very favorable to this uh, uh, idea, and I will let you to discover with your own eyes what was at that time the prediction concerning the eastern border <laughs> of EU and uh, the currency. It's an unfinished business, and this is why we will need a new political uh, leadership for finishing this business. Thank, Thank you. you very much, Titus. Book um, up. <laughs> 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 yeah, now we, the, um, I think one of the lessons I derive from your presentation, in particular your emphasis on the Balkans, is that uh, the assurance or near assurance to enter the, Soviet, the, <laughs> the European Union, you will understand uh, the reason for my confusion, is a guarantee of stability. Would Igor Jurgens, who is uh, the president of management board of the Institute for Contemporary uh, Development in Russia, apply this vision to the future of Ukraine? Uh, thank you very much, everybody and especially Thierry, of course. Uh, my institute, 2008, went public in asking Russian leadership to join the European Union, under certain conditions, of course. Uh, but it was not something original, because Mr. Uh, Putin himself, in 2002, asked uh, the leadership of the European Union what would be the conditions, what would be the time frame, etc., etc. So he was given a cold shoulder for different, very sensible reasons. Russia was not ready to join European Union. We then asked for NATO membership, same reply. Uh, Russia is an entity in itself, and of course, uh, I would love to uh, subscribe under what uh, the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Romania said, but I cannot because of the sheer size and the number of problems which Russia has. Otherwise, my choice would be European Union. But it doesn't matter that uh, it's, it's a realistic choice at the moment. If you ask me uh, in one word, how would you describe the situation in Russia, I would say, and that's normally Terry uh, always like to tease me th this way, 
In one word, I would say pragmatism. Uh, if he says, okay, use two or three words, then I would say pragmatism bordering on cynicism. And that's exactly what happens towards Ukraine, towards Georgia, towards Moldova, towards Eastern Partnership, and, and so on and so forth. Mr. Putin has every justification to, to, to do what he does at the moment, for, because uh, he doesn't have tactic, I mean, he doesn't have uh, long-term strategic thinking, I, I think. He was not built that way. He's a, he's a good leader. He showed a lot of uh, uh, strength and hunch for success and, and, and control of the power in, in a very difficult country like Russia, but he does have strategic uh, thinking. And at the moment, I think that if, if, he, if he were a strategically minded person, it's very difficult to make choices. European Union, we know it's still in the process. United States, he uses the weakness of Mr. Obama in mean, Syria and, and, and other issues. Uh, what will come out with uh, our Chinese strategic partnership is, is, a, is a good question and big question mark, and so on and so forth. So he takes a pause, he uh, tries to win tactically here and there, and he tries to uh, stabilize the situation. And here I have a problem. The stabilization of the situation is like in, in Alice in the Wonderland. You have to run fast to stay in the same place. And at the moment, Russia says that we want investment, we want uh, immigration because we, we have a short of, shortage of labor, we want uh, technologies because the Soviet Union is uh, past us and we don't have technologies. We need all of those three. We have to open, but we're closing down. Because as an economist, I can tell you that we are in a very fruitful dialogue with economic wing of our own government. Sensible people, we talk about uh, uh, budget consolidation, we talk about uh, proper fiscal policy, monetary policy, broad uh, uh, corridor for Russian ruble to, uh, uh, to match and to, to face all the, the difficulties which we are going to face, and so on and so forth. Then I take this head off, and as a politician or, or, or public figure, I can tell you that nothing more crazy than this reactionary twist of internal politics I, I haven't seen. You know, uh, we were talking about religion, now the religious fanatics, not, not the proper Russian Orthodox Church, but religious fanatics uh, taken up a hand. We talk about NGOs, all NGOs are called foreign agents or something like that. We talk about uh, uh, Pussy Riot, uh, 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 Two women did something wrong in the church, now sitting for two years in prison for, for no, uh, for no uh, uh, crime, actually. The, it, it was not depicted in the Russian criminal code, and so on and so forth. So there are two Russias at the moment, pragmatical and cynical Russia divided into sensible people, 15, 20% of the population who want to move forward, who want to, to be contemporary, and about a silent majority which is afraid of any changes because the external environment and internal situation is getting worse. Uh, we could have met all our social mandates when the GDP growth was seven, eight percent. Now at the moment it's two and we cannot. So the salaries of the army, the salaries of the security, all public sector salaries, uh, the students and, and all of this is going to present a serious problem. In this environment, when we receive the news that Ukraine wants to join the European Union, we would applaud. We, those 15, 20%. But uh, I ask another question. Uh, do you really think that Ukrainians are ready for this? I would say that Ukrainians should say honestly what, what I'm saying. That with this President Yanukovych and with the group around him, no, they're not ready to join the European Union. They're not ready to honor uh, the obligations and so on and so forth. So, uh, paradoxically, it would be better if Ukraine is allied to customs union, which is one step down in terms of economic performance. And then, as promised, Eurasian Union is done in a way as infrastructural bridge between China and European Union. That makes logic, but in, in any logic, there is uh, something uh, illogical and, and imperial, and I'm, I'm sure 
uh, that uh, the people who now have an upper hand in Kremlin and around it will play it as a political uh, project and not as an economic project. And that would be very detrimental. If I'm asked the question what to do, if I, if I were Barroso, I would do exactly what uh, is announced today, I think, uh, on television, that uh, we suspend the negotiations, we wait till 2015 elections in Ukraine, uh, and then Ukrainians decide for themselves. Russians shouldn't get this Pyrrhic victory because to pay another 10, 15 billion dollars immediately uh, and then every year to replenish the coffers of this uh, not very uh, uh, kosher politician, uh, Mr. Yanukovych, I think it would be a big victory for Russia. Thank you very I, I'm much. sorry that I have to leave and I, I have to, 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 to give some space to other people. Thank you very much, Igor. Excuse me. Thank um, you. I think we move to America. Uh, Igor was telling us that there were two Russians. G. Moglen, contributing editor to the Washington Post. Are there two Obamas? Because sometimes when one look at the foreign policy of uh, the United States, it seems that the president himself is divided between two instincts. In the case of Carter, you had uh, clearly uh, a moderate voice, Cyrus Vance, a less moderate voice, Zbigniew Brzezinski, and the president was moving between one advisor to the other. In the case of Obama, he's surrounded by advisors that, that are supposedly like him, but him, Obama, is two people. He seems to be shifting between moralist instinct, I want to intervene, I have to intervene, and very prudent uh, instinct. What would you say? You wanted to concentrate on leadership in America. What are your answers to those provocations? Uh, merci, Dominique. Um, and I want to also uh, congratulate the happy, I hope happy few, brave few who are here this afternoon who have stuck it out to the bitter end. It's people like you who make conferences work. And I, I thank you for that. Um, to go to Dominique's question, I think there is really one consistent Obama. Uh, and, well, at least there's one voice that he listens to, and it's his own. He doesn't uh, brook arguments between his advisors very much. He makes up his mind, then he listens to arguments, and he wants to hear every argument there is against what he has already decided and not announced. And then he pursues what he'd already decided. Uh, the Syria case is a little different, and I'll get to that. Uh, but you, you raise a really interesting and important point, and that is the question of uh, leadership and the style of leadership. It, it has its consequences. And I think one of uh, the president's shortcomings is that he doesn't look uh, far enough ahead at consequences of what he does. I remember that in the, uh, really the first days of the administration, or at least the first G7 meeting that Obama attended, I remember talking to a fellow uh, leader, one of his fellow leaders, afterwards about this new American president. Uh, and this person made a very interesting point, which was that Obama, in contrast to George W. Bush, did not really seem to care what his peers thought of him. Bush, this person said, wanted to be liked. Obama doesn't care. And what, he doesn't care what the others think. Um, and we've seen that played out again and again in an administration that has done more and has done, had more success in some ways in dealing with its adversaries than it has with its allies. It's certainly reached out far more toward adversaries than it has to some key allies. And that has consequences. It fails to build up a reserve of personal relationships that can be called on in moments of crisis, in moments of difficulties. And I would say that Obama's reserve tank is surprisingly low for the leader of the country that is still the world's leading economic power. You can argue about how long that will continue to be. I don't think you can argue about the fact that the United States is still the world's leading military power. Um, that, that is the nature a little bit of the American condition today. Uh, I think it's really important to focus on a sentence that he said recently when he said, I end wars, 
I don't start wars. And that clearly is what he wants to be remembered as, uh, as the president at this point. Uh, he sees, it seems to me, and this is the, the crux of the matter, he sees American power abroad as a glass half empty. That is, it is a wasting asset. It is a declining power, although still very, very powerful, uh, that has to be managed carefully. I was really struck by Igor Martin saying that Russia is running faster to stay in place that's very much Obama's view of the United States, of what he has to do as well, because many of his decisions, which seem to be um, perhaps inconsistent with what he says at the beginning, and he does something different. I, I think all presidents do that. But it is the effort of a, essentially a status quo power to maintain a certain status quo. I would argue that is the meaning of what he did on Syria, where he uh, took an opportunity to get out of something that he seemed to have promised to do, to buy time and let events perhaps rescue him from bombing Syria, which is something he did not want to do. And what he opted for was a solution that maintains, in many ways, the status quo. Uh, it uh, legit, as Itamar Rabinovich said, it legitimizes Assad. It keeps Assad in place to carry out the chemical weapons uh, agreement. Uh, and it abandons, in effect, the opposition and the rebellion. Uh, certainly, there'll be no significant American support for it while this chemical weapons question. And it's similarly true that the deal with Iran, if there is more than a interim agreement, will legitimize the status quo, that is, to keep Iran as a nuclear threshold state. Um, there's been an implicit understanding, I think, between the White House and the Iranians for some time that if the Iranians did not exceed a certain threshold in the nuclear development, that the United States would not strike Iran and would try to prevent Israel from striking Iran. This interim agreement is one that almost automatically renews itself at the end of six months. And I can see a position where it is extended one more time and then one more time after that, rather than going to all the problems that a final deal creates. So that would be an extension of the status quo as well. Um, and that will be nearly in your next point, your last point. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> um, and just, just a word on Ukraine, then perhaps we can talk about it later. Um, the American absence on Ukraine is striking. Uh, and again, I think it's a, a, a major part of the status quo mentality. Whether or not America could dramatically affect the Ukrainian situation is, for Obama, a very open question. I'd just like to end, Dominique, if you'll permit, uh, by thanking not only Thierry de Montbrial, but his very energetic and capable staff for having helped us all uh, get through the conference. And to make one uh, point of uh, order, uh, there was a statement a couple of days ago about um, how much Don Graham had wanted to get rid of the Washington Post. That is a totally inaccurate, false statement. Thank you, Dominique. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, we'll move west in some ways uh, with uh, a person who has been in himself, a transatlantic figure. Karl Kaiser, who is now adjunct professor at Harvard University, after having been for a very long period of time the director of the German Institute uh, for International Affairs, will address the issue of transatlantic relations in five minutes, bullet points, as you said. And I'll make three points. And I'll start with a personal remark. Uh, when I moved back uh, in 2003, I was very much struck by the fact that by 2003, Europe had disappeared uh, on the public intercourse, on the radar screen of intellectuals, uh, of congressional thinking, uh, in a long process that started with the end of the fall of the wall. Europe was gone. Where's Europe now? Europe is back, but it is a very strangely twisted Europe. It is a Europe in crisis. Uh, the Euro, uh, Britain leaving, 
uh, and people do not at all take note uh, of the fact that Europe is actually also has lots of achievements. It has something to do with the fact that uh, people don't read French, German, or Italian papers, but they read English papers, and in the English papers for the last five years, you have the constant debate about the pending collapse of the euro, uh, about the British exit uh, that is threatening, so no wonder. But it's a very dangerous perception because it misleads uh, public opinion and it potentially misleads uh, politicians. My second point is a follow-up in a way to what Jim Hawkins said. I think the Europeans have insufficiently taken note of the fact that there has been a paradigm shift in, American, in America's way of looking outside and dealing with the problems of the world. And I think the Libya crisis, crisis was the crucial point, and it's a, it's a point of structural importance. It was a point in which uh, Obama made clear that America is no longer automatically available to be on the forefront of dealing with the crisis. It will be there to help allies and others, as happened during the Libya crisis. Indeed, without American help, I think the intervention would have failed uh, in, in its purpose. But it is a very different kind of America that, that, uh, that we are facing here. And it has a great deal to do with domestic circumstances, the fatigue after the two last wars, the, the gridlock of the system, the disappearance of bipartisanship, the polarization of the system. So the America uh, uh, of the past is no longer exactly the same anymore. And there is a second consequence, which is very important for the Europeans. The Libyan crisis has shown, and it was a wake-up call, how insufficiently Europe is prepared to deal with a world in which America is no longer exactly available as it was before. Europe was not exactly a free rider of American security policy because it wasn't free. Europe, after all, has a higher defense budget, the second largest defense budget in the world. It has more soldiers than the United States. In fact, the defense budget of Europe is more than the BRIC countries together. It wasn't free, but the assumption always was in Europe, the major problems are taken care of by America. That is no longer true. Uh, and, and that has to be translated into European action. The kind of things that um, Carl Bildt said uh, yesterday. Uh, a review, pooling and sharing, uh, uh, doing, spending the money better than in the past. And that takes you to my last point, which is of fundamental importance, uh, and that is the rebalancing toward the Asia-Pacific, which came up now and then during, uh, during the debate. I think it is the most important shift in American strategy since the end of the Cold War, though its consequences will take time to materialize, but it's there. And I think it's in the interest of Europe, because we are looking at an Asia where conflict, the incident of conflict is rising. It reminds me of 19, late 19th century and early 20th century Europe. Rising economic power, rising armament, arms race almost, uh, rising uh, chauvinism, nationalism, incapacity to deal with the problems of history and the past, and no institutions to, to mediate. The perfect, and territorial conflicts, the perfect concoction to cause conflict. So it is in the interest of Europe that America rebalances. But it means that America withdraws partially. The 300,000 troops that once were in Europe are gone. 40,000 may be left. But the problems for America will still remain right next to Europe, as we all know. We discussed them now for the last two days, Syria, Iran, and all of it. So it will take time, but nevertheless, the process is, is taking place, and Europe has to ask itself, should we rebalance together? And um, that means that Europe has to give up its purely commercial strategy toward Asia. It has to rethink its own role, hopefully a mediating role and a supporting role. And finally, it means that uh, it has to, Europe and America have to rethink the nature of their mutual relationship. One is the transatlantic trade and investment partnership is one geopolitically very important process because it means, besides liberalizing what is left to be liberalized, to redefine the rules for the system 
those rules that regulate areas that are not regulated, after all, it's almost 50% of the world GNP that will define them, and hopefully it will work in the liberal tradition. And secondly, it means that Europe and America have to rethink what will become of NATO when it withdraws from Afghanistan. And that is an unsolved question and of fundamental importance. Thank you Let's very much, there. Carl. Uh, there is a country that sometimes sees itself as a bridge between Europe and Asia, and that is, of course, Turkey. Uh, we had, at the beginning, a Turkish voice uh, from the government. Uh, in this uh, final panel, we have a Turkish voice from the opposition, uh, with uh, Yusuf Ziyairbek, who is a member of the Turkish parliament. Merci beaucoup, merci, uh, monsieur le moderateur. Monsieur, merci beaucoup, monsieur le président. Et Thierry Montreal pour organiser, pour avoir organisé une telle conférence efficace pour l'amélioration du climat de dialogue dans le monde entier. Je vais continuer maintenant en anglais. OK. We and have, you have six minutes as well. OK, others. thank you very much. <laughs> we have, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we have a democratically elected government and a government a prime minister uh, who is defining himself very democratic. King Abdullah said in an interview in March, Atlantic, uh, uh, the review was Atlantic. Erdogan said me once, Democracy is a bus right. If you need it, you get in. If you, uh, uh, if you don't need it, you get out. This is not my, uh, my definition. This is the definition of the prime minister. If this is the case, the name of the party is the Justice and Development Party. On the development side, there is no problem uh, because uh, of many reasons. I won't go further to that part, but on the justice side, there are many problems. If the name of the party is justice, you should not permit uh, to so many journalists to send to the prison because of their freedom right of expression. This is happening in Turkey. There is, unfortunately, a problem of freedom of press. This is one case. Another one is the freedom of expression. I'm in the opposition. I'm re-elected for the second time. But I was more in the government side than in the opposition side. I live, I have the experience. Uh, I have the experience in that case. I saw uh, very clear that everything is defined in quantities. The prime, vice prime minister is defining once again here by the opening session, by the opening session, uh, the freedom of uh, press with the quantities of more than 400 uh, radios and uh, increased number of televisions. This is, this is maybe possible, but for the concept of a better understanding, better dialogue between the societies, between the culture. We, sh we have in Turkey a very multi-dimensional uh, culture. A politician should be ready to understand all of the dimensions of Christianity, of Ju Judaism, of Islam, and of all the other uh, religious groups. This is the basis in order to be an efficient leader in Turkey. But I don't see a development in such direction. The reason is, in order to let function a democracy, you should try to have a very efficient opposition. If you make mistakes, 
the opposition should have the possibility to convince you or to defend you against these uh, negative impacts on international level and on national level. Nobody is God. Nobody is a dictator. In the democratic uh, uh, election process, we don't want to have a dictator. Therefore, we, we want to be criticized. We want to, uh, to see ourselves in the mirror. The mirror of the government is the, is the opposition. But in Turkey, the prime minister, if you can uh, uh, look at the speeches of the prime minister, Alhamdulillah, thanks to God, I have these two weak oppositional leaders. This should not be the statement of a democratic leader. This is, I was also candidate on this oppositional side. I don't want to go to, the, to that side more, but I was registered by his party without my knowledge as member in such a way, my, my membership in my party was deleted. I was not able to go to the Congress of my party. This is happening in Turkey. And on the other side, the economy is fine. There is no problem. But where is going to Turkey? Radicalization is another problem. Religion is used for uh, different purposes in order to gain more votes. This is a wrong one. The people are radicalized when you use for those reasons, for election reasons, the religion. This is one point. Another point, at the end of the Second World War, we had less than 50 countries. Now we have close to 200 countries. It means more nations, more cooperation. In the future, nobody is expecting that the number of the countries will increase, decrease. The number of countries of the countries will increase in every hundred year. There are uh, somehow uh, reorganized uh, systems, reorganized new uh, new structures, and so on. This is caused by what? Uh, it is not our question now, but, but this is happening. Look at the Vienna Congress, 1815. Look at the First World War after 100 years. Look at the situation now after 100 years uh, now in that time. And, okay, I'm, I'm ending. No, I have to um, contradict you. Okay. Contrarily to what you said, there is no dictator. Yes, there is a dictator. I am the dictator in the name of time and justice. Okay, so thank you, you very have, much. Thank you very much, <laughs> Yusuf, for part, your I understanding. Uh, express uh, okay. Now, we move to another subject, uh, which is really fundamental and at the heart of everything. So, uh, Donald Joth Johnston, uh, former Secretary General of the OECD, uh, will deal with the issue of corruption. You have also five to six minutes to deal uh, with that fundamental issue, which is the poison eating up at so many situations. Donald, it's yours. <coughs> well, thank you, Chair. Um, you asked me what I would enjoy speaking about, and I mentioned corruption in part because I just came from the celebration of the 15th anniversary of the adoption of the anti-corruption, anti-bribery convention of the OECD which uh, Transparency International played a big role in. And, uh, and because I'd been the Secretary General at the time, we managed to get that through, and we were all very enthusiastic about it at that point. Uh, I was, I'm pleased to say that the people present remain enthusiastic. Uh, Peter Iden, who was the founder of Transparency International present, was the president, and Mark Keith, who was uh, one of the stalwarts in this and has chaired the committee for 20 years, was stepping down. So it was sort of his funeral and the anniversary at the same time. Now. Uh, I raise this because I think it's not really on our agendas to the extent it should be. I heard very little about that, although I missed all some of the sessions, but I don't think uh, corruption was addressed. I hope uh, perhaps our, our president here, Thierry de Montbriand, will think of this in another context. Just give me, let me give you just a few facts. The, 
The World Economic Forum has established a body, as you know also, which Mark Peter is very much involved in. They estimate that 5% of the world's GDP is represented in terms of corruption. Uh, and of that, the World Bank, whose statistics are pretty good, says it's at least one trillion in terms of bribes. Bribes is only one part of corruption. And that all of this stands in the way of social and economic, political uh, development, not only just in the emerging markets and in the developing markets, although principally there, but also in developed markets. And you know, we have a scale of countries where corruption ranks very high, and many of them are signatories to the bribery convention. In fact, the one that may be, should be there, but it's not, is China. Now, in the last year, I've been invited to speak about corruption in two, in two countries. One is Serbia, and twice in China. Uh, they're very concerned. As you know, Serbia, the question of its membership in the EU was turned in part upon this, turns in part upon this whole issue. And in China, China's refused so far to sign the, the bribery convention. But even if it did, would that really solve the problems? Because the convention was meant to get at countries who are suppliers on the supply side of corruption and to basically establish a level playing field amongst industries across the OECD countries where most of the bribery originated at that time 15 years ago. It distorts trade. It basically undermines uh, governments. It, uh, corruption basically makes people lose faith in their uh, democracies or in their government. I might give you an example of Tsinghua University where I spoke in January they have done a sondage in China on what are the Chinese people most preoccupied with. They had 10 items. Number one was food safety, which we also discussed here. Number two was corruption. You can imagine that. How many countries in the world would that be at the top of the agenda? And you may recall that when President Hughes stepped down, he said corruption could basically destroy the state, destroy the party, and even bring down the government, bring down the government itself. And here's the second largest economy in the world making that kind of statement. Because it's so systemic that it can actually have a macroeconomic impact, which it does in many, many countries. Uh, we heard good things about Africa today. Uh, Mo Abraham, with whom I had a conversation afterwards, I think is on the right, right track on the demand side because he's talking about governance. Whenever you see good, clean governance, you don't see the kind of corruption and the private public sector. And mind you, the numbers I'm giving you is simply public private sector corruption. It's not corruption in the private sector, which we all know exists in all of our countries. None of us has clean hands. Not one country. I mean, we've had our own bouts in Canada recently. The United States has had them, usually locally, usually municipal, this kind of thing. But nonetheless, I just raised that issue with you, that I think that we're not going to make a lot of progress bringing some of these countries forward unless we get into this issue. And World Bank gave us one other statistic, that 20 to 40 percent of of official uh, direct aid, that's aid from the banks, from the agencies and so on, 20 to 40 percent is basically diverted away from its purpose and finds itself in private bank accounts in Switzerland and elsewhere. And of course, we're getting at that through another <coughs> series of attacks. It has to be attacked on many fronts, but I just want to leave you with the fact that I think corruption is much more serious than we acknowledge. Thank you very much. Uh, now we move to a continent uh, that has been a bit overlooked this time in this uh, sixth uh, global uh, governance conference, and that is Latin America. Uh, we are very privileged to have with us uh, Carlos Perez Verdia, who is the chief of cabinet of the uh, Foreign Affairs Minister of Mexico, but he mentioned specifically to me that he wanted to speak of Latin America and not only Mexico. Thank you, Patrick. Thank you very much, uh, Thierry, for the invitation. It's an honor to, to be here. Uh, before I jump into Latin America, I would like to talk about what I think are the main uh, issues happening in North America that will define how Latin America is seen and progresses in, in the next uh, few years. And there I will talk about uh, two things, mainly. One is trade, and the other one is energy. Um, the NAFTA, North American Free Trade Agreement, turns 20 years uh, next year. Uh, the increase in uh, trade has been uh, stupendous. We crossed the one trillion mark in 2011. Uh, it's uh, increased by about a factor of four or five. To give you an idea what this means at a bilateral level, Mexico and the US trade more than $1 million every minute of every day. 
Uh, so this is just huge. And it's not just about the volume of trade, it's also about the integration, the production integration. Uh, another example, uh, for every dollar that the US imports from Mexico, there are 40 cents of US produced manufacturers. Uh, the comparable figure for China is only four cents. So it's an integration that goes uh, on, the, on the production chains, but also, of course, on, on society. 65% of uh, Mexicans have a favorable impression of the US. And I think this is really outstanding given that uh, we don't only have benefits, but there's also a lot of challenges to, to our relationship. So the, the issues on trade that will define how North America goes forward is, of course, the transatlantic uh, trade and investment uh, with Europe, uh, which only the US is at the table. I think we would have uh, all liked to have been there and negotiate uh, as, as partners. That's not going to happen. And we are all, of course, on the uh, Trans-Pacific, uh, the TPP uh, treaty. So what uh, Canada, Mexico, and the US have to make sure is that these treaties do not water down the, uh, the benefits of, of NAFTA. The second issue uh, is energy. And you know the, the numbers. We talked about uh, Canada during lunch. Uh, the U.S. numbers are just as impressive. Uh, it has gone in the last five or six years from producing five million barrels per day to eight million barrels per day. By some estimates, it will add one million barrels per day for the following five or six years. That, that is impressive. Gas prices in the U.S. are maybe a fourth or a fifth of gas prices uh, in, in Europe, but they're also half of what they are in, in Mexico. And this is, of course, not because the oil and gas uh, reserves finish at the border, but it's because Mexico has been relatively inefficient uh, at its investment. Uh, not enough investment, uh, relatively inefficient. But the good news there is that three days ago, uh, the Mexican Congress passed uh, a very deep uh, reform, which basically opens up uh, the energy sector for investment in Mexico for the first time since uh, 1938. So uh, during the debate in Congress, there, there were um, insults traded, uh, there were punches, um, there was nudity. So if you, if you measure the uh, structural reforms by how much fewer they cost at the legislative body, this was uh, really, really big. Um, so uh, we are, I think, focusing on uh, North America that has, that has the potential to be incredibly efficient and incredibly uh, competitive. Um, there are, of course, other issues, uh, security, uh, migration, but um, what we think uh, we need to do is focus on a multi-thematic uh, relationship. Um, just in passing, I have to say that it's very interesting that we are not talking about uh, Secretary Kerry's announcement a couple of weeks ago that the Monroe Doctrine, uh, which defined the relationships uh, between the US and Latin America is over. Actually, it defined the relationship between Europe and Latin America. So it's my, lat uh, my European friends that should be packing their bags and ready, uh, ready to come. So what does that mean uh, for, for Latin America? Um, there are, of course, many different political models uh, in, in Latin America, and these are usually the headline-grabbing issues, but what we think is that we need to go for more integration, and that it's going to come through uh, commercial integration. And here we have, uh, Patrick, two um, poles, I think, or, or uh, a continuum, but uh, on one side we have Cuba, where we have uh, interesting developments and the uh, refreshment, the, the reaffirmment of their uh, economic model, I think is something to, to be watched. Uh, let's, not sit on, let's not sit on the edge of our seats, but uh, that's very interesting. We see the private sector leading uh, in, into Cuba, which is very interesting. And on the other extreme, uh, we have uh, the Pacific Alliance, which is an initiative composed of uh, Chile, Colombia, Peru. In Mexico, um, 200 million people uh, probably it would probably be the uh, eighth largest country uh, if it were uh, standalone. And what's impressive is not just these numbers, but the speed at which it has been uh, moving. Since 2012, uh, we have uh, managed to get rid of all our uh, beginning of 2012, uh, all our non-trade barriers or all our trade barriers. 95 percent. The rest of the five percent is. Uh, 
ready to go in the, in the following years, and it goes also towards financial integration and towards labor movement. We have not spoke, uh, been speaking about this in, in Latin America so, uh, before, so we're uh, very excited about that. Now, of course, just as in the case with North America, Latin America has a lot of other issues and challenges, and I think the positive thing there on, on drugs, on security, on human rights, is that we are dis discussing these at a regional level, and uh, we are very much uh, betting on the Organization of American States. We're betting on the UN General Assembly uh, 2016 discussion on drugs to guide us and tell us where to go. Thank you Thank very you. much. It's always better to end only on a positive note. Uh, last but not least, uh, Stephen Erlanger, who moved from being the chief correspondent of the New York Times in Paris to be the chief correspondent of the New York Times in London. Uh, comparison, is Paris the place to be and London the place to do? Uh, or uh, what would you say? Well, first I would say Paris me manque. <laughs> But then I would also say, um, it's hard. I'm the last of eight speakers on this panel. At the end of a very good conference, Thierry, one of the best I've been to, thank you. But it reminds me of a story that Christine Lagarde, a great French representative, likes to tell. She said it's, she sometimes feels at the end of a panel like she's the eighth wife of Don Juan and she knows what's expected of her, but she's not sure how to make it interesting. <laughs> so, forgive me, Christine, but um, I feel a bit in that position. Um, I am a little worried. I mean, I'm a little inquiet. When you're here in this place, you can feel like there's a Europe that there's a Europe of elites, there's a Europe of intellectual conversation and exchange. Um, sometimes it doesn't feel that way on the ground. I really think Europe is losing its attraction to the rest of the world. It was an example to the world of shared sovereignty, of this great experiment, of the post-Kantian blah, blah, blah. But I think even you see it in Turkey, there is a sense that the soft power has lost its power. The softness is getting softer and it is no longer seen as a model for other people, though everyone wishes it well. I mean, I certainly wish it well. Um, I have the professional deformation of having covered the last real European war, which was in Kosovo. Um, I am glad to be next to the Romanian foreign minister. I'm seeing a kind of other European war over what's going to happen in, on January 1st with Romanians and Bulgarians. The racism that comes out on the issue of the Roma is really scandalous. It seems as if in Europe there is still one people that one is allowed to hate, and that is the Roma. Um, I see Europe doing a very bad job at integrating a policy on immigration, on integration. Um, and I worry about two other things, and this is where I'll be more specific. Um, I had five and a half years in France and, and, and love it very much. Um, but I sometimes think France, Philip um, Hildebrand, today said something like this. It's like there's a kind of alcoholism. You don't know there's a problem until you admit to yourself that there's a problem. And France has a problem. It can be fixed. I'm sure it can be fixed. But it requires a kind of political courage that I see lacking. I mean, just to give you a couple figures, the state now represents 57% of GDP in France. That's 11% higher than in Germany. 46% of the state budget goes to social benefits. There are 90 civil servants per 1,000 people in the Millefeuille. In Germany, it's 50, it's almost half per 1,000. 
The national debt is over 90% of GDP and rising. There hasn't been a budget surplus in 39 years. Hourly wage costs have gone 10% higher now than in Germany, and 13 years ago they were 8% lower. Growth in real wages is slipping below productivity. A thousand factories have shut since, 20, since 2009. Social spending is 32% of GDP, which is the highest in the OECD. Tax revenues are 45% of GDP, the second highest in the OECD. 82% of all new jobs in France last year were temporary contracts, up from 70% five years ago. Students have an average of 144 days in school. The OECD average is 187. 55% of all French university students drop out, of uni drop out of university before the second year, prepared for nothing. Um, it's a vibrant economy, it's a vibrant country, but the decline is real, it's slow. It's slow, but it's real. And I worry, I really worry that France, which already has having a problem with its own self-image in the world, in a Europe where Germany seems big and powerful, is slipping into the third tier out of the second. Um, and that's a problem. I mean, it's still having babies, and maybe in 20 years it'll have as many people as Germany, and, and the German model is cracking too, let's not forget. Um, so I come to an England where actually some of the economic figures are worse, particularly in terms of budget deficits and unemployment. Um, but what worries me about England, just because we're near the sea, is it slip, slip sliding away. It's losing its moorings. And I don't know what a Europe is going to be without Britain, but I don't, I don't want to see it. Um, there is... I lived in Britain 25 years ago, so I've come back. It's a, it's a very odd feeling. 25 years ago, it was Margaret Thatcher and Ronald Reagan and the Soviet Union, and Britain was important. It felt important. It was a world player. And today, it is thinking about leaving even the European Union. It is very self-centered, self-absorbed. It is, feels frightened. I mean, the debate is about immigration. The debate is about cost of living. The debate is is about foreigners coming in and eating up London. It's, it's not a self-confident debate. And um, you have, for the first time, you have a coalition government, but you also have, for Cameron, he has an actual enemy on his right wing, which is the first time a Tory prime minister has had that in UKIP. Now, UKIP can seem ridiculous, but it's not le front national. It's, 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 it's a little more plausible than that. Cameron has within his own party probably 100 MPs who are simply anti-European. I mean, you could give Britain anything, and it wouldn't be enough for them. Um, and this, this is troubling. Um, and, and again, in terms of leadership, there are just very few people so far willing to stand up and say, you know, we're not having the right conversation. So, this is, I don't want to end on a down note, but I do want to end gentle dictator. Um, but um, this, is, this is what bothers me. So I hope as the eighth wife, I've made it a little bit interesting. Thank you very much. Thank you also, thank you to all of you. Uh, because uh, you have been remarkably disciplined. Uh, we, had, we have had eight people uh, in the amount of time allotted to us. Let me just, say three things. Uh, it would be impossible and totally artificial uh, to relate exactly what you said. But there are three things that seems important to me. The first one is that leadership really matters. Margaret Macmillan, the remarkable diplomatic historian, just published a book uh, on the origin and the causes of World War I called the war that ended peace. And uh, her conclusion is that she cannot say why World War I took place. Except, and she says it very specifically, Bismarck and Salisbury were no longer there. 
and the people who had replaced them were not of their quality. And that may have made a crucial difference. So to each of the issues we've touched upon, from uh, Ukraine, uh, from Turkey, from France and Great Britain, from Central Europe, whatever, from America, of course, there is that fundamental issue of leadership. The second uh, problem, uh, I would return to that question of corruption, uh, which is really uh, fundamental. Uh, there was a, a Chinese voice who said recently, and who was quoted by Roderick Matvaka from uh, Harvard University, if China does not tackle corruption, the country is doomed. But if China tackles corruption, the party is doomed. And this dilemma is, to a large extent, a dilemma that you find in so many countries, and that is so crucial to the issue of governance. And then the third question, I would, in a way, challenge a little bit, Stephen. Uh, yes, uh, Europe does not make dream the Europeans any longer. There is a divorce between the European project and the European citizens. But Europe continues to make dream non-Europeans or Europeans who are not, not yet, members of the European Union. I mean, as I speak, there are hundreds of thousands of people in the streets of Kiev who are demonstrating in the name of the European Union. I'm not sure the European Union is ready, willing to take them in, but the door must be kept open for them as the door must be kept open for Turkey. This is, uh, these are fundamental issues uh, which we must keep in our head. Now, uh, Monsieur Thierry de Montbrial, I think uh, we have come to uh, the end of this debate. Uh, I want to thank, uh, in your name also, Thierry de Montbrial, for another excellent uh, conference. de travailler d'une manière positive pour maintenir un monde ouvert. Un monde, j'ai envie d'ajouter, raisonnablement ouvert, parce que l'ouverture parfaite, c'est un, un mythe. Mais maintenir un monde ouvert quand il y a tant de pression vers la fermeture, c'est un défi. Et je crois que tout, euh, toute l'ambition que nous avons pour euh, cette World Policy Conference, c'est euh, cela. Alors, J'étais heureux que Dominique Moisy, dans ses conclusions finales, parle de leadership. Car, en effet, le problème de leadership est un problème essentiel. Je me souviens d'une conférence à Ditchley, à laquelle d'ailleurs Marie-Roger Biloa se trouvait il y avait un peu plus d'un an. Et Jean Chrétien nous avait dit, donc ancien Premier ministre du Canada, que quand on parlait de gouvernance, il fallait toujours se rappeler qu'il y avait des leaders et que souvent, les problèmes, au-delà de la technique, au-delà des difficultés bureaucratiques, etc., les problèmes se réglaient entre les leaders et souvent par la rencontre physique. Et d'ailleurs, j'en profite pour dire, nous avons eu une séance à la fois passionnante et un peu terrorisante hier sur le, la cyber, le cyberespace, mais euh, je crois que l'idée de tenir ce genre de réunion à travers des écrans, etc., euh, ça ne marche pas. On peut régler comme cela des problèmes techniques, 
Mais quand on parle de problèmes humains, et la question du leadership, c'est une question humaine, il faut se rencontrer, euh, se rencontrer physiquement. Et, et ça, je, je voulais aussi le dire avec une certaine force. Mais en effet, ce problème du leadership est un problème absolument majeur. Quand les choses vont bien, euh, des défauts de leadership peuvent être rattrapés. Quand les choses vont mal, la question du leadership devient euh, absolument essentielle. Alors, maintenant, pour euh, conclure sur... Euh, le, le, je, je, je vais, conformément au rite, remercier tout le monde. Et comme on dit aussi, je ne vais pas nommer tout le monde. Et remercier tout le monde, je voudrais remercier euh, naturellement tous nos intervenants, euh, tous les participants. Et comme c'est un club, il n'y a pas de différence fondamentale entre les intervenants et les participants. Beaucoup de participants sont des intervenants et euh, vice versa. Et c'est la qualité, évidemment, des participants de ce club qui en fait la valeur et qui en fait la crédibilité. Je voudrais également remercier nos hôtes de Monaco, le, son Altesse royale, le prince Albert II, sans, sans qui nous n'aurions évidemment pas pu nous, nous réunir ici, euh, et son gouvernement. Et je remercie également, c'est très important, tous les sponsors, parce qu'il y a l'argent, c'est le nerf de la guerre, même pour ce genre euh, d'organisation. De, de, et je les remercie, ces sponsors, parce que je crois qu'ils nous soutiennent, parce qu'ils ont compris ce que nous voulons, ce que nous voulons faire. Et ça, c'est évidemment euh, essentiel. Ce n'est pas du, 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 du mécénat euh, directement euh, intéressé euh, ou, ou intéressé à, à court terme. Je crois qu'ils comprennent, ils partagent la, la vision. Et puis, bien sûr, je voudrais euh, remercier les équipes. D'abord, euh, Sang Nim Kwon, qui est ici. Euh Alors. Bon, je ne suis pas jaloux, elle était davantage applaudie que moi, mais elle le, elle le, elle le mérite. <rire> je crois que vous avez tous été en rapport avec elle. Et elle a fait un travail, une fois de plus, extraordinaire. Et avec ses collaboratrices qui travaillaient avec elle. Je voudrais remercier Nicolas de Germain, le délégué général de la conférence, qui est parti un petit peu plus tôt cet après-midi, que beaucoup d'entre vous connaissent. Euh, qui n'était pas là l'an dernier pour des raisons de santé. Nous sommes très heureux qu'il ait pu être avec nous cette fois-ci. Je voudrais remercier Florent de Chanteracte. Où est-ce qu'il est, Florent Il est caché, hein, hein Florent de Chanteracte et, 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 et toutes ses équipes. Et rendez-vous compte, par exemple, je vais vous refaire le même numéro que l'an dernier, mais je ne sais pas si vous avez réalisé euh, hier soir... Le, 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 le travail extraordinaire que représente la transformation de la salle, puisque ici, nous avons la salle de, de réunion, derrière, nous avons la salle des, des repas, et euh, dans un très court laps de temps, euh, à, dans, dans l'après-midi, tout a été transformé pour, pour faire le, 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 la salle du magnifique dîner de, de gala, et, et, et tout a été rétabli après dans la nuit bah, pour euh, qu'on puisse... Euh, travailler aujourd'hui comme les, les journées précédentes. Donc, Florent, merci. C'est un travail extraordinaire. Et je voudrais également remercier APCO, euh, qui euh, est non seulement notre partenaire, mais euh, également nous a conseillé et aidé pour les problèmes de, de communication. Alors, euh, je ne... Euh, et, et naturellement, euh, tous les collaborateurs de, et amis de, de l'IFRI euh, qui sont, euh, si j'ose dire, omniprésents. Voilà. Est-ce que j'ai oublié... Euh, on oublie toujours quelque chose. Si j'ai oublié quelqu'un que je n'ai pas remercié, que cette personne lève la main. <rire> bon, qui ne dit de mots, consente. Permettez-moi... Pardon Ah ben oui. Ben oui, 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 oui. Voilà. Alors, n'en déduisez pas que c'était... C'était peut-être un coup monté, d'ailleurs, Pierre, hein ah, ah, qui sait Permettez-moi quand même d'avoir un mot spécial pour sa sainteté, le, le patriarche Bartholomé, qui maintenant euh, participe euh, à ces, ces réunions euh, régulièrement. Et euh, votre sainteté, je, je voudrais vous dire que vous apportez à chaque fois une note qui est hautement, euh, hautement appréciée. Donc je vous remercie infiniment. Euh, et infiniment d'être l'un des happy fuse, comme on disait tout à l'heure, pour cette séance terminale. Et bien maintenant, mesdames et messieurs, je, je crois qu'il est temps d'arrêter. J'ai quand même une bonne nouvelle. C'est qu'un repas sera servi tout à l'heure sans discours. <rire> sans discours. 
mais ce sera un repas quand même. Merci, bon retour et euh, à l'année prochaine, mais enfin certainement entre temps aussi. Merci. Merci beaucoup d'avoir joué le jeu.